Bullshit. Pretend for a moment we've entered a parallel universe free of bullshit and full of bold solutions. That's what the OBS Marketing Show is all about. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich. Our guest today is Dave Watson, CEO of Phoenix Rehabilitation and Health Services. But first, let's cut the bullshit. According to the American Job Satisfaction Survey, 49.6% of Americans are satisfied with their work. That's the highest level since 2005, and yet still only about half of us like our jobs. The major reason cited by unhappy workers is they don't find their jobs interesting. Economists say the lack of passion will hurt productivity, while healthcare practitioners like Dave worry about the impact on our well-being. Since I'm neither an economist nor a physician, I'm going to focus more on creative productivity. Miss Kruger, my eighth grade English teacher, had a sign above the blackboard with only one word in big, bold letters. Think. While I'm guessing she was addressing our inability to think clearly about punctuation and grammar, her sign can actually help us focus on the big picture from a career standpoint. How much time do you spend thinking beyond your daily, repetitive activities? Do you take the time to figure out what you want to achieve throughout the year as opposed to the day or week? When was the last time you really wrote down a personal and or professional growth goal? Time and again, we work with clients who struggle to truly focus beyond the current day, month, or quarter. Our mentoring programs here at Mass Solutions see talented individuals struggling to move beyond hustle and bustle activities rather than creatively focusing on meaningful growth. Why? Maybe strategic thinking is misperceived as pie in the sky, or it could be a lack of confidence or time management abilities. Whatever the reason, you can change by taking the time to think. What's the one thing that would make your professional life better? Write it down. Now brainstorm and list three or four tactics to move you towards achieving this goal. Put deadlines next to each one and begin working your plan. After you achieve some success, think about another goal and write down the action items to reach it. You might think your situation is more complicated and you won't be able to do it but you can. It all begins with taking the time to creatively focus on the big picture, or as Miss Kruger's sign said, think. The No BS Show is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash no BS. Try a book like The Girl with the Lower Back Tattoo by Amy Schumer. You can download it for free today. Go to audibletrial.com slash no BS for your free audiobook, over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Our guest today is Dave Watson, President and CEO of Phoenix Rehabilitation and Health Services. Dave founded Phoenix and partnered with four other physical therapists that all recognized a need for comprehensive rehabilitation and physical therapy services. Phoenix, headquartered in Blairsville, Pennsylvania, opened their first center in 1997 and have since opened an additional 60 locations. Now, that's growth, folks. Dave, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Well, as you know, having listened to the show and met some of the other guests and knowing some of the other guests pretty well, we always start with that easy question. It's a, it's a, it's a softball pitch to start by having you walk us through your educational background and your career journey. It's a, it's a lot like a lot of other physical therapists, but similarly, uh, back in, uh, well, we're talking back in the late 70s, uh, college education came out of University of California with a BS in physiology. And then decided I lived my whole life in the state of California, so I wanted to go to the East Coast, applied and got into Duke University for a master's degree in physical therapy. That led to jobs A, B, C, D and e, from then on. But that's the that's the training of a physical therapy program. Now that led that was a master's. Now today they're a doctor of physical therapy. The the programs have shifted to a little bit higher level. They don't learn anymore coming out. They they just got a bigger title. So so from there, uh, from um, Duke University, I went back to San Francisco and got my first job. The one I ideally wanted in my career was to work for the United States Public Health. Um, there's seven 
uh, uniform services in the United States. I bet you can't name them all. I could probably name four. You can name probably all the ones that carry guns, right? Yes. So Marines, Army, you know, the five, the uh, all those, right? I can only name four. Air Force, Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines. What's the fifth one? Coast Guard. Oh, Coast Guard. I should yeah. know that one. Okay, so what are the last two? The last two. Now, this takes a little bit of thought process, right? So I already named one of them for you, so you should have been able to do that. United States Public Health Service, which comprises uh, hospitals, clinics for uh, Native Americans. And at that time, they had hospitals for what were, uh, what you know, seagoing uh, people uh, that came in ocean going from other countries. So in the old days, these people come in very sick. So there was hospitals at every seaport in the United States. At that time, President Reagan decided that those hospitals were superfluous. So he closed them all. And I lost my job that I always wanted after just two short years. But back to the other one, what's the seventh and last one? And it's the United States Oceanographic and Admi Administrative NOAA, you know, the, the people that do the... So we all wore, uh, in those two services, the uniforms of the of the Navy, really. They're white. So we, yeah, I look like an ice cream guy, you know, like <laughs> sold ice cream on the side. But, but it was the greatest job in the world. I learned to do EMGs, which uh, is a diagnostic test. To, for muscle and nerve disease. And very few therapists know how to do that. But I was lucky enough to learn from some of the best there. And the, re the other reason that job was great and had a significant impact on me was that we took patients first, not the doctors. If they had anything to do with a musculoskeletal problem, we took them. And we acted as if we were doctors, so we would order tests, x-rays, whatever. And that doesn't happen out in the real world. But it's such a better delivery system because we'd be an entry system like a nurse might be to be able to triage and say, no, this this is not a big deal. We can fix it here. So it saves resources. Instead of sending the simple things to the most highest paid person, you start out at lower levels, which the healthcare system decides not to do. Anyway... I went from there. Since I lost that job, I, lo I was looking for another job in a private practice somewhere in California, thinking I had to, I wanted to stay out there. But lo and behold, someone called me up, a, a classmate of mine at Duke who was a year behind me, and said, hey, I got this great opportunity down there, but we need someone who can do EMGs, which I had fairly well mastered. And it's there's a doctor down in uh, St. Thomas, of all places, in the Caribbean, who an orthopedist who doesn't have physical therapy and he needs EMGs done. And I said, well, what's a, what's, what do you think the story is? And he says, well, he wants somebody to open up a private practice right next to him. Well, you can't tell orthopedists no, because that's where most of our patients come from. So I said, well, why not? I have no idea how to open up a private practice, no idea how to run one. I've been in a hospital in 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 entire an entirely different system, and so that was a rather big, unique uh, category in my life of just again lifting up and going entirely across the country, only now to the Caribbean and wow. living. Stay there for four years. Uh, I got uh, shouldn't say it that way. My wife became pregnant, and we had our we're going to have our first child, so we decided to move back. And lo and hold, lo and behold, the person that helped me find a job back in the States was the guy that helped me focus on St. Thomas. So the, the former classmate had uh, knew somebody up in the States in Indiana, Pennsylvania, of all places. And I've been living there since 84. Started with a, a gentleman that had a single office private practice in Indiana, PA. And over the next uh, 13, not uh, 84 to 95. So what's that? 11. 11. There we go. I, I'm not a math major. Um, yeah, we went to, uh, we grew it from zero to 55, one to 55 clinics. And I was the president and chief operating officer of the company when he decided to sell the company. Not ter necessarily a bad decision for him, but a terrible one for everybody else because he sold it to the wrong people. And these people were crooks. As soon as it was sold, uh, the auditors walked out. Uh, we ended up in a huge problem. I ended up on the 85th floor in Wall in, down on Wall Street trying to figure out what everybody was yelling at me about and realized only later that that was what was called a workout room. So I was there to try to save the company because 
there was they were going to pull the plug on it. So luckily, I was able to talk them into keeping the assets all in one place, letting us do our work because we were doing great physical therapy and everything else and just clean up the company that we that was bought. We were actually bought, but the other company was terrible. So we ended up taking it over it. So tell, describe a workout room for our listeners. <laughs> a workout room is uh, something that is cold and occupied by steel, chairs, a big table, and a lot of lawyers and bankers. And they do nothing but grill you. So I had arts CFO and myself, and we spent basically eight hours of one whole day. There were about 20 other people in there, but just us two. And they went over point by point, asset by asset, office by office. And since we really didn't know much about that new company that we joined, it was kind of a kicking them down the you know, the uh, path and keeping Keystone whole and as well as we could. And it was successful, except the only way it was really going to work out is if the former owner took a haircut, a major haircut, because he got paid too much for what the whole thing was worth. And that would have made really good sense, but he was unwilling to do that. So he became a antagonist to the whole thing. He got kicked off the board. He got kicked out of his office. We were on the board. We had to run the company and keep it going, and he he wouldn't agree to do this. So we ended up having to fight him off in a proxy fight. And a proxy fight is basically a large shareholder saying, I disagree with it, and I'm going to sue you, the company, even though I own most of the shares. I'm going to sue you, the company, to get back my position and whatever else I want. We ended up in the Delaware Supreme Court try in this case. Why Delaware? Well, we were a Delaware-based uh, company, corporation. So it ended up there. And this, to this day, they say that they made the wrong decision. They sided with him. And he got his company back. And that kicked me out, which was a terrible decision at the time, but a great decision in the end for me because that led to Phoenix. Phoenix Rehabilitation came out of the, quote, the ashes, and that's why it's named Phoenix, mm -hmm. because it was, I learned so many things I never want to learn again and never use going through that two-year period. So from 95 to 97, we were basically in court or fighting or firing people or fixing things, or it was a, a hell of a lot of work. But at the end, in 97, we started Phoenix, and, and I took with me, some founders out who were good people out of Keystone, and we started Phoenix. And ever since then, we've been growing. That's Dave Watson, President and CEO of Phoenix Re Rehabilitation and Health Services on the No BS Marketing Show. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich. So we got two Daves. So Dave, let me just go back a little bit. I know we don't want to spend the whole show talking about all these specifics, but just to give the audience a little bit of generalities, uh, whenever, whenever you were going back to the previous owner and asking him to help save the company, were we talking about him giving back 20% of what he was paid, 50%? Like, was it reasonable or was it just impossible for him to do? It would have been a restructuring of the debt that he he was paid $5 million up front. Well, we needed that $5 million. He didn't necessarily need that. He was just paid that. And all the rest of his his uh, was in a note and stock and the rest of it. So it was more immediate cash that we needed. But he wouldn't agree to do that. So the bank was putting us in a position of having to take some big notes and some huge risk just to stay liquid for that first period of time. He wouldn't have had to take a big cut at the end, but he potentially had to give up that that five million uh, down payment, so to speak, and that was he wouldn't he wouldn't agree to do that at all. Hmm. And he thought that basically it was going in the wrong direction to do what we were going to do to try to save the company. And what we were going to do was kick out basically all the stuff that was done by the other company. And they they were doing mobile diagnostics and a whole bunch of other stuff that was losing a lot of money. And so it was kind of an easy fix, but he, for some reason, he didn't like not being the CEO. Huh. They had a workout specialist come in, you know, one of those really gruff and ugly and mean people. <laughs> and he didn't like him. And, and frankly, I didn't either at first, but you learn, you learn <laughs> to live with evil when you have to. 
And then that was that was kind of a a big turnaround. The company actually did after after we lost and I left that. Keystone was sold to another company called Benchmark, and then that was sold to another company, and then that was sold to another company. But in the end, there's a story, a, a twist in the end that's helping Phoenix right now. And we can get to that later if you sure. want. But. Let's, let's get to that in a little bit because I do want to come back to the name and everything. But I have to go all the way back to him because you showed some leadership and ability to take risk and some vision a number of times. So first, you grow up in California, you go to the University of California, you graduate and you decide to come to the East Coast, which I wanted you to talk about how you went through that thought process, but then also to get accepted at Duke has to mean, you know, you, you had to have done great on undergrad and had a lot of uh, natural intelligence. So I think it's a big, uh, big kudos to you to get to accepted to Duke and to go there and to finish your master's. But talk about the decision making process when you left California to come to the East Coast. I've never been one that's really comfortable staying in the same thing all the time. I somewhat get bored um, if it's repetitive. Uh, so I like to challenge myself and make change. And I think that's how you grow as an individual. You certainly can do the same thing over and over or stay with the same company, but if you don't challenge yourself personally. So I thought the best way to see the rest of the country, the way to get out of where, and I always thought I was going back and living in California. So we, I said, I'll go across the country and, and go to Duke. The funny thing is that's the only school I applied to. I took, I took a risk, <laughs> but it was kind of in retrospect, that wasn't the right thing to do. I should have applied to a bunch of places, and then, but I wanted to go to Duke. I thought that had the best name of all the physical therapy schools, and it matched my criteria being on the East Coast, and I was able to actually travel while I was going there in different places. So it made sense for me to do that. And then challenging myself was like, I wanted the best job that would teach me EMG, so I had to get a job at U United States Public Health Service. But I had to wait after I graduated about six months. So I had, I was cleaning windows and houses and babysitting and mowing lawns during that period of time to make enough money to live on while, while I was waiting for the job to open. The No BS Marketing Podcast with Dave Mastovich is brought to you by Mass Solutions. Put our three-step No BS process to work for you. Visit MassSolutions.biz today to take your marketing to another level. It's all about bold solutions. No BS. Let's go back to Duke real quick. Are you uh, a big Duke uh, alum in that you love the hoops team and everything? Ooh. I didn't know anything about ACC when I moved out there, and I became a huge fan. The year first, I think it's the first year, yeah. Um, uh, they Duke went on to uh, the Final Four and won okay. uh, the, the NCAA. And, oh, my God, that stadium and – and that that crowd, the the students get to sit right on the floor. I mean, they really are right front and center. So I went to every every game, and back then I could get in every game. Nowadays, people, you know, tent city, they have to sit out and wait and see if they can get in. But back in those days, the the fire was still there, but it wasn't as near as popular. But wow, AC! I got turned on to ACC basketball like that was just the best thing in the world. The football team, no. <laughs> Never really was that big, but the, but basketball turned into being such a big thing. And so we, I even won uh, ticket options to go to the final four, but I was too poor. Uh -huh. <laughs> so okay. I had to give them away. And then you take a bold, another bold move, you leave the country. So talk about the St. Thomas experience and how, you know, what was it like when you got there and how'd you make, uh, how'd you make do and all that? Well, you know, I, I, I'm still at that point, I just lost my job at the public health service and, um, I, I hadn't been paid much at that point anyway, you know, back in those days, your salaries weren't as high in anything and, you know, certainly for a physical therapist. So I just said yes out of the blue. I said, I'll go give it a shot. And I went down to St. Thomas, uh, gosh, I think it was um, August or so of the year. And so it was, you know, the summertime and nice. But down there, it's the same all year round. It's summertime all the time. So when I first moved there, um, it was it was a clearly challenging position. I, you're, you go from a, 
mainland to an island in the Caribbean and you know no one and you're now thrust from what used to be a you know 83 percent of the population was white here well 83 percent of the population is black there you become a minority and somewhat felt like one and you know that gave it the opportunity to so to speak, study what the other half or the other percentage live like. But it, it didn't kill me, but it made me stronger to learn how to deal with diversity and deal with some of those things. But when I got down there, I didn't have much money. And I think this is what you want me to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a small condo that we, we took up almost all the money we could make. And um didn't really have much money to live on. So food was even a challenge, especially on an island. It's very expensive because everything's shipped in and, you know, it's it's difficult. Even even a six-pack of Coke was five times more expensive than it was when I lived in the States. But um, I figured out living right next to the beach that there was a food source I could go find real easily. And I was a really good swimmer. So I used to, every night, come back from work, go out onto the beach, put on, you know, flippers and go and get two lobsters for my new wife and me. And we'd come back and eat, you know, all we needed to buy was butter and we had, we had a whole dinner. So <laughs> for, the, for the first, I'm going to tell you, for the first two months, literally every night, I came home, I went and got lobster. And it was so interesting because it was so easy. I mean, there were so many of them and you just went and it was legal. You just go down and pick them out of the rocks and bring them home and cook them. So we had fun. You go down and you grab two at a time and you swim back up. That's all you had to do. Come out of the water, walk up, take your fins off, walk to the, and it was only maybe 30 yards to my, into the condo, walk into the condo and my wife had a pot of hot water ready. You just drop them in and <laughs> away you go. 20 minutes later, we're eating. Lobster every night. Lobster every night. It was probably why I had gout now, but <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun. What else do you remember from that? It was a four-year four, four year period? A four-year period that I started the practice. And, of course, I didn't know. I came from a hospital that didn't know anything about running a business, number one, or... Uh, how to run a private practice, and uh, but I had really good training from those two years. Um, there were some people at public health that were just excellent. These these uh, these therapists n- knew it all, and they literally passed it all to me, and I, I sucked it up like a, a a big sponge. So I clinically I was ready. Business wise, not so much. I made a lot of mistakes in the beginning, but at the same time, I learned every step of the way. So I had an office space that was probably not much bigger than your studio here Mm -hmm. that we're sitting in. Mm -hmm. And I started one by one uh, going out and learning how to talk to doctors to get patients. I knew how to talk to doctors clinically, but now I was after something from them to gain their trust and gain them sending patients to me. So it was more like, send me a patient, I'll show you. Send me a patient, I'll show you. There was no other physical therapy on the island. So a lot of these doctors may have known what it is, but they hadn't used it in years and years. So I was the first professional physical therapist that they'd ever seen. They'd have some what they called bone setters and massage people and other people that they sent to. But this was the first time. So it took a while to, especially the landlord of the building I was in, he was the largest family practitioner, but he wouldn't give me the time of day. He'd rent to me, but he wasn't going to send me any patients. It took two years before I finally broke down. He broke down and sent me a patient. So talk about that from a messaging standpoint. You're you're basically selling something to your referral sources that they kind of know but aren't used to having. So how did you go about packaging the message? Well, I was stumbled around to begin with because I obviously didn't have the skills that you have in marketing. So I just went in with all the only thing I had was sincerity. Mm-hmm. I just walked in and said, "I need help. I need I need you to send me patients." It doesn't hurt your business as a, a, a provider of healthcare to find solutions for your patients. And I'm telling you for, and then I'd have to go through the, what I can do as a physical therapist for your patients that would be helpful. And they had to learn it almost all again, many of them. The orthopedist, luckily, that was there, I didn't have to cajole to teach and he was ready because he needed EMG. So I had a small base of patients that kept me in money and living for a little while until I can convince other doctors that um, 
Plus, I was, uh, you know, as they called us, Continentals, coming down there trying to make money on them. And I was working my ass off. Oh, I don't know if I can say yeah, that. Yeah, you're not. It's an OBS show. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> um, uh, I was working my ass off to make everything work. And a lot of these uh, doctors were not not taken kindly to me just because I was white. So, uh, and Continental, which was probably worse at that point. So, it was kind of an interesting juxtaposition of where, you know, you came from. But I took it in stride and said, well, I'll wait. Just as if I went in down there, you go into a bank and you don't get, you could be in line, but you, the person behind you will get called. And you had to learn to take that. So you just, so I used to go in the bank and sit down and start reading the paper until they called me. And finally somebody would, okay, you can come up now. It was wow. just weird. But the, all the, it, it was such a learning experience. I can't tell you. I learned a lot about what to do and what not to do in business. And I learned how to explain my own way to doctors who really didn't want to have me anything to do with me but i had no competition so it was helpful there couldn't be anyone better than me right it could only be me so it was that was that was a, a gift to me for later on in my career learning to do that certainly helped me come back to the states and i can do that anywhere with normal doctors well, you did. You you had to sell and you had to persevere and you had to have good messaging and the authenticity was huge. So I think that's important. And we're going to get into Phoenix throughout the both episodes of the show. So right now, though, I want to focus on your mentors. Uh, who are your mentors other than family and, and how have they impacted you? Well, funny thing is, you know, I've had several in my career. One at public health was uh, a gentleman that uh, taught me how to do EMGs. And he was... He was a great character and a great clinician, but he was the kind that left no stone unturned. You know, you didn't skip step B when you started out at step A. You had to go to B, even though you knew it wasn't going to be fruitful. You did not skip it. That's not in my DNA. I, I'm ready to skip to the step I know what the answer is, but... With him, I couldn't play that game. And so I had to learn how to slow down and take detail work on and go through it in that manner, which was difficult for me at the time. I'm usually the kind of guy that, you know, just walks out and says, I know what this answer is. But I learned to step back and learn how to say, okay, don't do that anymore. Treat each new patient the same way and go one step by step by step. That, that worked out fine. Uh, you know, him. Uh, my... The next one was probably the guy we talked about a little bit about selling his company yes. the wrong to Keystone. He was, he could sell anything. He could go out. He created and took risks on skipping steps. So I went from someone who was doing the step by step to someone who said, and, and forget that, we want to go after the big big picture. We're not going to just go and open an office. We're going to go get a, get the whole hospital contract. We're going to go get a whole nursing home contract. We're going to, so he was really good at business and really good at taking big risks. He, which is somewhat what also his downfall was. He, he was a big gambler and sometimes he took too big a risks, which backfired, but he always did very well. He always landed on his feet because he was sincere and and he took huge risk so i learned so i kind of got both sides of it and i was able to learn be, both pieces not to take the big scary risks learn to take you know bring some stepwise thought process on how you're going to go after that and the, both of those things grounded me kind of sort of in the middle and I, now i could take risks but i could have a little a little less scary uh, outcomes it's amazing how having uh, multiple mentors makes such a big impact on us and the impact lasts uh, for our entire lives. Question on this, um, is that gentleman uh, still, is he still alive? Oh, yeah, yeah. He, Are you on good terms? Eh, no. No? <laughs> okay. I, unfortunately, I was, his, I was his most loyal employee. Uh, he had... As I said, he took big risks. He he had a lot of people and fired a lot of people, and he would get mad at them at a, a drop of a hat. Every partner, every other significant person had either left him in disgust or got fired. I was the one that stayed for so long. But in the end, he was wrong. In the end, he had to help us, and he wouldn't. And so then I crossed onto the other side and, and fought him, and that ended our relationship for the 
I don't know, for the best good. It turned out wonderful for me because of where I'm sitting now and what in Phoenix, but he isn't hurt either. He ended up going through several other companies, and I think eventually he got paid his money, although I don't know how that actually turned out. But I ended up with somebody else who's working for us now that was in that that whole sold, 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 sold company. And he ended up moving up the chain, became the chief operating officer. And I've hired him for our company to be the chief operating officer now. And he actually fired the guy that I was telling you is the mentor and the guy that as he moved up, he moved over the other guy (laughs) and he ended up having to fire him. So the full circle comes around that I kind of get my, up and back to him, you know, we were very close friends. He was very good. He was a great mentor and he certainly gave me something that is so invaluable in the experience. But in the end, it was kind of bitter and very ugly. So when he did get fired there, it was kind of like, well, he should have been fired long ago. <laughs> Hear more of my interview with Dave Watson of Phoenix Rehabilitation and Health Services on part two 